Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. Today is the beginning of a multi-session because the subject is huge. And I didn't realise just how big this subject was until some of the work that we did a little while ago when we tried to do the Iron Man test on lenses. Now those tests gave us some very interesting data but at the same time they also raised quite a lot of questions. And the more I've been thinking about some of the strange little quirky results that I saw, the more I thought we need to look much much closer at lenses. Now without a lens this machine is useless but the way in which the beam is focused is fundamental to what we can do with this machine. Now I learned a great deal about lenses when I was trying to chase down the smallest dot. Now that's the other extreme of what we're really interested in mainly with this machine which is cutting which is what most of you guys want to do with it. Now cutting requires lots of oomph whereas engraving especially very fine dots requires a very delicate approach to putting the power down. Now one of the things that I noticed when I was doing my dotting work was that the focus is not exactly stable. If you change speed when you're trying to put down dots the focus changes as well. You say hang on that's not possible. A lens has got a focus point. End of story. And that focus point is a constant. Yeah, that's one of the questions that began to raise itself in my mind when I thought about lenses. The first thing we've got to establish is what is the manufacturer's focus point? What is this thing called a spot size that the lens focuses the light down to? And how can that change when it's a, a physical fixed dimension? Is there such a thing as a, a dynamic focus? Well, that's one of the things we're going to experiment with in this very first part of a three-part session. As I said, we're going to look into lenses in the nth amount of technical detail and I've got a huge amount of work ahead of me. Now this little frame is designed to hold these little test pieces that I've made. Because I've got so many tests that I'm going to be doing, I've designed this little jig and these test pieces so we get nice consistent results. And the idea is that we put this little test piece and sit it on the jig there so that there is a 10 millimeter slope on this test piece. I'm setting the focus right in the center, the correct focus, whatever that is, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Then we're going to run a test four millimetres above the perfect focal point and four millimetres into the work by running up this slope. Okay, now what I've got here is 10% power running at 10 millimetres a second. The next one we've got 20% power running at 100, 200 and then 400 millimetres a second, all with speeds on that hopefully are going to give me fairly uniform thickness of lines. We need some mechanism by which we can assess where the thinnest point of this line is and that's quite difficult to do. We can try and assess it by eye, you know, we can see where the line starts to get thinnest around about there. So you can see immediately, although I set that up on centre, so it's not truly in the centre point. And that one, about there. I've gone from 10, 100, 200 to 400, but between 10 and 400, look, well, these marks on here represent one millimetre change in the height of the focus. And so we've gone from here to about here, What's that about inch? Uh, that's about one and a quarter, one and a half millimetre change in the focus between 10 millimetres a second and 400 millimetres a second. So this very strange phenomenon that I noticed when I was doing dotting work is real. And it brings into question 
how do we define focus? Now, this is the dynamic focus change with just a one and a half inch lens. Why does it happen? Perhaps questions that I'll try and answer because I have spent quite a lot of time thinking about this and trying to make sense of this dynamic change in the focal point. So I'm going to be using this nozzle. It's got a four millimeter hole in the end and it's quite a long nozzle, but it has got the lenses mounted inside the nozzle here like this. Now this is a one and a half inch lens. It's flat side down as you would expect it to be because that's the so-called correct way for the lens and we're going to talk about that as well. Now, this might not exactly be entirely scientific but I'm just going to rip the end off this little cotton wool bud because this is a nice soft plastic it's hard plastic but it's not going to do any damage. And what we're going to do is to drop that in there so that it touches the lens. Okay so now it touches the lens up to that point there. So that lens has got an internal dimension of 32.1 millimeters between the end of the nozzle and the flat face of the lens. Now this claims to be a 38.1 or inch and a half focal point lens. It is a plano convex. Here is a, a pretty reasonable simple description of a typical lens and the way round that we are using it which is the way that it shows let's call it the correct way that's not the way that the Chinese install these lenses in your machine when they're delivered they're always delivered with the convex side face downwards the real thing is we've got something in here called F which is what they decide is the focal length and then we've got this thing here, which I have just measured. Well, we haven't measured it yet, but I'm measuring from this front face, and this is called the back focal length. Now, there is something on here called the front focal length as well, which is what happens when you turn the lens round and you use the lens the Chinese way. And so that is something that I will be investigating as well during these tests. The difference between FB and FF and how that relates to F, which is presumably what we've been sold, 38.1. It's difficult to say, but from this diagram, we could assume that the nominal focal point, which is here, this F, is roughly from this centre of the thickness of the lens. Don't worry about what I'm doing with this lens because this is a junk lens and the uh, anti-reflective coating has been scarred off of this side when I did my stainless steel tests. I damaged it so this is just a junk lens and it says it's 3.2 one eighth of an inch thick. So therefore, 38.1 minus half of 3.2, which is 1.6. Technically, that means that we have got uh, a dimension here, FB, 36.5. We have just measured... this dimension here at 32.1 and so therefore if I take 32.1 from 36.5 we shall finish up with 4.4 beyond the nozzle to the focal point. I've very carefully designed this jig so that the centerline point here actually reflects the center line of this across here like that. So I'm going to use this surface here to accurately set my focal point. Snug on 4.5. I haven't got a 4.4 setting piece. So that's the correct focus for our test. I'll just do a quick pulse test. You can see that I've got my focus set up onto the true center line there. But as near as I can tell, I've got that set correctly as well at 4.4, 4.5. 
we can immediately see that the thinnest part of that line is probably somewhere there. So I'm working my way back, I'm working my way back down this thick line to where it gets to about its thinnest point, which is about there, and I'm going to do the same for this. On the basis that the central point between there must be the thinnest part of the line, because that's where the neck comes down. And light travels in straight lines, so it's going to be the same shape after the focal point that it is before the focal point. Now, as I said, without a microscope to do the exact measurements, this is a fairly crude method, but it is showing the same pattern of results that we saw just a few minutes ago. We're getting a change in the focal depth as we increase speed. But the bigger question now is, we set this focal distance for this lens exactly to the correct place. So we didn't get the finest cut, the narrowest part of the cut coinciding with the focal point. Perhaps you can remember this test that we did, where we kept the power constant and we increased the speed. Now this is the unfocused beam, remember, which demonstrates the problem in a much better fashion. You can see the difference. Now this clearly demonstrates the fact that the line gets thinner as we get faster. But hang on, why is that? Now here is the shape of our beam. And when we're running slowly, we're giving the beam enough time to burn out to the lower power part of the beam. And as we get faster, we can only allow this part of the beam to burn into the material. So the beam is changing shape because of its Gaussian distribution of power. This is the high power right at the tip of the beam, and this is the low power being given to burn a much wider path as we get slower. Okay, now let's take that picture and translate it into what we're seeing here. Okay, now very crudely, you can see these very light lines, that's the beams coming from the lens. Now, as we know that it never actually crosses over at the middle here to give us nothing. There is a very, there's confusion that takes place here, and we get a bit of a neck in this point here. But this thin neck at this point here is a thing that we call the spot size. And that is the definition of where F or FB comes from. The thinnest point. But hang about, at that thinnest point there, we have got a Gaussian beam distribution which looks like that. What I'm saying to you is, we're able to burn below the focal point, because that's where our highest point of energy is. So as we start running up this slope towards the focal point, the theoretical focal point, which is here, we're able to do damage with the high energy part of our beam before we get to the theoretical spot size, which is here. Well, that's a great hypothesis, but how on earth are we going to go about trying to verify it? Well, I think there are at least probably two ways that I can do it. The first way is a very crude way that I think you will probably immediately understand. Now, I've got the power set to 15%. It might be 8 or 10 watts. Now, this is the 1.5 inch lens <clears throat> that should be set to 4.4, if you remember, the gap. And what have I got here? I don't know, 40 millimetres? So a quick pulse. And even a quick pulse at 15% does that for me. Bring the distance up a little bit. I think you can see clearly that as we're coming up, 
it's spread out after the focal point and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we're getting towards the focal point. Now I can't get much closer than that but I think you clearly see that we've got a change in the size of the beam as we get closer to the focal point which is about there and then it starts to get bigger again as we come up above the focal point. Now as you can see we took no precautions on that at all, we didn't do any measurements or anything but what I'm going to do is we're going to go and have a look at those under the microscope. Okay not a lot of interest going on here other than as we gradually creep towards the focal point you'll see the energy density in the beam increasing and the damage to the paper becoming more intense and darker and darker and then all of a sudden we get to a point where the darkness has taken over almost all of the beam diameter and we've got a really high energy spot in the center where we've exceeded the damage threshold of the paper and burnt through it and the beam continues to get smaller but we've got the same size hole in the center and here we are, we've reached a point in the centre of the screen now where we've probably almost achieved the focal point. And the hole in the centre is more or less the same size as the focal point. And now we've gone beyond the focal point and we've still got the same high energy density core. So I don't think there's any doubt there where the focal point is and I don't think there's any doubt there that we have got a spike of energy which is projecting quite a long way down below the focal point so that it can damage that paper. Now while we're here we can just have a quick measurement of that hole in the centre there at approximately the spot size. This is a one and a half inch focal length lens with a theoretical spot size of 0 0.075 millimeters. To be fair, the theoretical spot size is based on high quality lenses and probably a meniscus lens where as much of the energy of the beam passes through a single point. It is a theoretical dimension, but here we can see we've got a spot size, before I measure it accurately, of about 0.5 millimeters, which is significantly different. But then again, this is a, a plano convex lens where we know with plano convex lenses we have got what I technically call a fuzzy focus point. So, yeah, it, it's maybe a bit difficult to judge on this, but it's certainly nowhere near the theoretical spot size. Now, this was just a very crude test to prove that that high energy density spot does exist below the focal point. We now need to be a lot more accurate with our assessment of how far this point projects beyond the focus point so that we can do comparison between different focal point lenses. Now way back in the dark ages um, my careers master advised me that I should never take up any art profession uh, and especially ballet dancing and uh, you've seen many examples of my pretty abysmal sketching. It, it conveys ideas but it's not pretty. Well we're going to go one stage better today and it's going to be even worse. Here we've got a slightly enlarged view of this spot size. Now I might well have conveyed the impression that what we're looking for is something of this shape. Not entirely true this gives the impression of what we're trying to achieve but in reality things are a little bit different to this and you need a fairly good imagination to try and convert this picture into the real world. Now for all our tests we should be using this thin card because it has a certain damage threshold and that damage threshold is not very high so therefore we don't need to fire a huge amount of energy at it. We can scorch it we can make it dark black or we can make it literally vaporize and it's the vaporization element of this paper that we're using to determine the energy density at various parts of the beam. There is this point of energy right at the spot size so the spot size 
is say 0.1 or 0.2 typically but that means that we've got a very very high energy density across that spot size and that energy density is sufficient to completely destroy the paper but as we move away from that spot and this is where my artistic talents are failing badly but I'm trying to convey the fact that we've got a high energy density here and that energy density is gradually spreading out as we move further away from the focal point and here we've got again we've got a normal distribution of energy which won't change the shape of the energy won't change but it's just that it'll be a lot shorter a lot fatter because the energy density will actually be lower now what we've got to remember is that across here the energy density is so high that it will put a hole in the paper that is completely the same size as the neck of the focus point the spot size but as we move further away from that spot the energy density gets lower but of course there's still enough energy in that area there to destroy the paper but what we're likely to do is to produce a bigger hole and probably with scorching around the outside so that's what we're expecting to find we're not expecting to find this point of energy that possibly you might be imagining where we got the focal point here and then we get a smaller and smaller dot as we move further towards this point that isn't the way that the physics works because this is actually growing and spreading out so we're going to get a bigger hole as we move further away from the focal point now bearing in mind this is a static situation this is not the same sort of situation that we looked at a few minutes ago when we were doing a dynamic track of this beam where we do get this thinning effect because of speed it's a very complex mix of power energy density and time that produces our gradually thinning line and our variable or dynamic focus point just in case you thought that was the only little issue that I want to display to you I'm going to do this I've got the same scenario there because whatever happens below the focal point is also happening above the focal point so what I'm expecting to find as I start doing my tests is a dot a dot and a dot big small big but as we get out here we should get more halo now for these next tests I'm not going to do them crudely as I did for our pathfinder tests I'm going to do them in a much more controlled manner now for doing my test work there are two features on this control panel which I rarely use but in this particular instance I want to show them to you because they have got their uses first of all if we press their due we can come down here to something called laser set and if I press enter I get the opportunity here of swapping over between manual and continuous now if I select manual most of you got most of you guys will have yours set on continuous but if you set it to manual you will get the chance to set the laser pulse power to a fixed period of time now in this particular instance I'm going to use 20 milliseconds for my pulse length and no matter how long I keep my finger on the pulse button it will only give me a 20 millisecond pulse now just above that we've got another little used feature which is very useful for my particular situation today and that's manual set so if we go and press enter we get a similar sort of thing but this time it's not to do with the pulse power it's to do with movements of the head so if I select that away from continuous which again is where you will be so that your arrow buttons will drive you left and right backwards and forwards in a continuous manner I'm going to select manual 
and I'm going to choose a number underneath here and zero. There we go, five millimeters. Enter. We will do our first experiments with the compound lens. I've got no idea what the focal distance for this lens is. What I do know is that it focuses at 10.5 millimeters below this nozzle. Press the arrow button and all I get as a five millimeter movement. I'm going to set that distance initially to 20 millimeters, which is way bigger than the 10.5 that I just mentioned. Let's go down to 18 millimeters. Okay, now I've moved along five millimeters. And there's my 20 millisecond pulse. Now, you don't want to watch me doing all this. I'll get a set of results sorted out for you and then we'll go and look at them under the microscope. Right, now I've purposely put a red background to my microscope and you'll see why in a few seconds. Right, well here we are with the compound lens at 20 millimetres above the work surface and as you can see we're just getting a bit of a scorch mark. At 18 millimetres, scorch mark. At 16 millimetres, hey, we're getting first of all a bit of a hole appearing and that's the reason why you can see the red through it now. 15 millimetres, hey, we've reached the damage threshold of the material now and we've punched a hole through it. And we've got like a double halo there. 14 millimetres, again, we've got roughly the same size hole, but we've got less of a halo and we've got a smaller beam size, as you can see. Beam size getting smaller, a little bit of a double halo there, but it's becoming a lot more compact. And then we get to 12 millimetres, 11 millimeters and remember I said the ideal setting point for this lens is about 10.5 millimeters well I never set to 10.5 we went straight to 10 and of course all of a sudden here we've got a bit of a growth again 9 8 now we're beginning to lose it at 7 6 well I think this clearly demonstrates that we've got high energy density spot above and below the focus point um, and it isn't just everything happening at the focus point. There was our ideal dot. Yeah, there's a hole in the middle there. And if we just see what size that is roughly, there's a 0.2 line. The dot is about 0.2, but the hole in the middle is probably closer to 0.1. So that's pretty well where I expected the focal point to be. And roughly the spot size that I expected, about 0.1, which is the whole size, the high energy density part. Just when you think we're beginning to understand this, I'm now going to introduce another factor, which harps back a little bit to what we saw before when we were running up the slope, the dynamic focus. Now we ran all these tests at 20 milliseconds. And there's our 20 millisecond dot at 10.5. Now I've left the focus exactly the same. It's around about a 0.2 hole at 10.5. So now I've changed the power. We've gone down from 20 milliseconds to 15 milliseconds, to 10 milliseconds, and to 5 milliseconds, then to 4 milliseconds, 3 milliseconds, and there is just a mark there at two milliseconds. That makes sense. The less time we spend on a dot, the smaller it's likely to be. We've already established that with line thicknesses. You know, the faster you run, the thinner the line. Well, here we are, much the same sort of thing, because if we put less power in, it's the same as running faster, i.e. we're putting in less power per unit of time of movement. And we get smaller lines, thinner lines. So this, this just basically proves the point. Less time, smaller dots. But there is a bit of a dilemma that I'm now suffering. I can't appear to get a mark on this paper below about three milliseconds. When I run my dot test for doing my photo engraving, I can run it at 200 millimeters a second with a 254 PPI pattern. Now that basically is a 0.1 millimeter per dot pattern. So that basically means I'm going to get 10 dots per millimeter. And if I'm running at 200 millimeters a second, then if I divide one second by 200 millimeters, I will get five milliseconds 
for every millimetre of movement. Now if I get 5 milliseconds for every millimetre of movement and I've got 10 dots in a millimetre, that means I've basically got half a millisecond to produce each dot. We've just seen that with a 20% power, as opposed to 14% power, which I normally use, I can't get dots below about 3 milliseconds per dot. So there's something going on in the high voltage power supply which allows me to do dots dynamically that I cannot do statically. Okay, I'm just throwing this in as a bit of a curveball. It really demonstrates what I was talking about earlier, which is something called the damage threshold for a material. You can clearly see these are two pieces of paper. The top one is the white paper that I'm using for doing our tests with, and the bottom one is the beer mat card that I use for doing my photo engraving. Now you can see the effect of damage threshold. They're both done at exactly the same speed, exactly the same power, but look at the quality of blackness and the thinness of the lines in the bottom example. So the blacker the dots and lines that we can produce, the more we should be able to replicate the print industry black and white standard for which this dithering process was originally developed. OK, so here's the one and a half inch results so that you can have a quick look at them. Now here we've got the work dropped right the way down so that there's a, a 15 millimetre gap between the focal point and the work. Right, so we're 15 millimetres low, then we're coming up to 9 millimetres. So somewhere between 9 and 6 we've reached the damage threshold for the material and at 6 we've well and truly smashed through it. And then at 3 millimetres, 2 millimetres and 1 millimetres we've got a nicely decreasing pattern of um, beam size and hole size. Now, two and one don't look dramatically different. And when we get to this one on the right hand side now, that is the supposed theoretical focus point. And it seems bigger than the one at one millimeter below the focus point. So at the focus point, we have a bit of a question mark. And then definitely as we start going above the focus point and checking for the beam width, we can see that it is getting bigger at one, two, and as big as I can get at three. After that, I can't really get much closer to the nozzle than that. But it demonstrates the point that we've still got power even at three millimeters above the focal point and six millimetres below the focal point. Now this is the two inch lens and it already has generated a surprise because at 15 millimetres we've got a bit of a dark circle forming in the middle of our beam and yet at nine millimetres we've we've reached the threshold and punched a hole through. Six millimetres, three millimetres, two millimetres, one millimetre. Now again, that's interesting, isn't it? Because look at two millimetres and one millimetre. Well, I'd say almost at two millimetres, we've reached what would appear to be the focal point. And yet that is the focus point, zero by calculation. And then we go above the focus point, one, two, three, six, nine, and 15. Okay, now this is a two and a half inch lens, but I didn't have a two and a half inch plano convex. So what we've got here is a meniscus lens, PVD, zinc selenide. And as you can see at nine millimeters, we've punched a hole through the material again. Six millimeters, three, two, one, and look, they seem to have stabilised out in terms of beam size. In fact, if anything, two might be a slightly smaller hole than one. Not a lot of difference between those three, look. And that's the focal point at zero. OK, and now we're pushing up above the focal point. One millimetre above the focal point, two millimetres above the focal point. They're still pretty powerful holes more or less the same size as at the focal point. Similarly, three. 
6, 9 is just about beginning to break down, and 15 has lost it. That is pretty staggering for a 2.5 inch lens, and it tends to blow some of my ideas out of the water. But on the other hand, explains one or two other things. Now what I'm going to show you here is a 2.5 inch gallium arsenide lens. Now I have to say that this is not a readily available on the open market and uh, Cloudray very kindly managed to locate one for me that I can test because I'm fascinated as to whether or not gallium arsenide is a better cutting lens than zinc selenide and that's going to form some of the basis of the tests that we're going to do later on but look nine six three two one now look at the uh, look at the focus there at two and one that's pretty good there's really almost the same size hole as there is beam size so we're certainly getting plenty of concentration of energy and zero now this is good because this indicates that zero is actually still getting smaller if we compare that with two one and zero so in this particular instance the beam size or the focus point is where it claims to be and then we start going above the focus point. Still there. Two, three, six, nine. So we've got power on these long focus lenses all the way from plus nine to minus nine above and below the focal point. Fascinating, isn't it? That explains all sorts of things to me anyway. We'll talk about that later. Now, after quite a few hours of work, I've managed to collate results here for five different lenses. And, uh, well, the results, to say the least, are interesting. They mean absolutely nothing as a set of numbers like this. And it's not until you start trying to put them into a sort of a graphical format that they seem to make any sense. Now, in this form, I can interpret that and see that the results are very interesting, but to you, they probably are pretty meaningless. So that is not the correct way to, to visualise um, just how important this information is. So let's just step back for a few moments and review what I've actually done. We've got some very thin card here, which has got virtually no depth to it. And what we're trying to do is we're firing the laser beam at it and we're trying to look at two damage zones. We've got this damage zone here, which is the halo. So that's a certain amount of energy density, which is enough to scorch the material. Now, I don't know what that energy density level is and it doesn't really matter. The important thing is that we're basically, we're basically, with this piece of card, we're able to establish three different things. The energy density that doesn't mark the card, the energy density that turns it brown, and the energy density which exceeds the damage threshold of the material itself, so that it produces a burnt hole in the material. So the only energy density that I'm interested in is that high energy density, however high is, and of course I said I, we, it's not very high because this is a fairly thin and weak material. But what we are using, we're using this material to identify the shape of this high density area. We had constant power, we had a constant control of the different depths to which we set the card away from the focus point both above and below and then we also had a constant time for the energy to be fired at the card 20 milliseconds so everything about the testing was completely repeatable and stable the card itself has a certain damage threshold that was stable as well so we've got to trust the results that we can see here. Now these results might be different for a different type of material. For example, if I had a harder card, then I might get different size patterns, but I shall still have the same sort of pattern. Now I have translated my results into a much more, if you like, understandable form. 
Here we've got the focal point across the centre there. And then we have millimetres from plus 9, in fact we've gone to plus 15 here, above the focus point, and 15 below the focus point, i.e. this is where the work is, and this is where the nozzle is. Now obviously for the shorter focal lengths, we couldn't physically get above the focal point very far because the nozzle itself was going to be in the way. Now let's just zoom in on these first two here. This first one is my compound lens and the numbers that I'm showing you here are the diameter of the hole that I managed to burn in the paper. 0 0.6, 0 0.2 and 0.5. After and above 0.6 there was no hole there was just this hatched area which is the scorch. So the hatched area on these is the scorch diameter and the clear area down the centre here is the hole that I managed to punch in the material. So we have here basically a profile, a map of the energy density within the beam itself. 0.6 of a millimetre is still a very small hole. It's about the size of that lead that's in the pencil there. And then it goes down to 0.2 of a millimetre at the neck and back up to 0.5 before the hole disappears. So basically we've got anything between three, uh, one, two, three millimetres above the focal point to one, two, three, four millimetres below the focal point. That's a range of seven millimetres over which we've got a significant amount of energy density. And it is a stick of energy density that is right down the centre of the beam, as you can see. Now when we move on to the inch and a half lens, you can clearly see how the profile has changed. Above the focal point, we've got, again, roughly a 0.6 hole, which is the size of that lead, down to 0.2, which is, again, the same as this one. And we come out here another two millimetres and it grows to one millimetre diameter hole. So we've got a different spread of energy density in here. The material threshold for damage is exactly the same, but it's just within that beam, the power is able to push another two millimetres on to get a one millimetre diameter damage hole. Now, these are, based, these are all drawn to scale. So you can see the relative differences in the power densities between these various types and focal length of lenses. As I said, this is the compound lens, which is not designed as a cutting lens, but it certainly looks as though it would cut. This is a one and a half inch lens, which has got a very strange spread below the focal point. Now this is a two inch lens. Now this high density zone runs from plus nine millimetres all the way down to minus nine millimetres. That's 18 millimetres of high energy density down the core of the beam. And it's enough energy to burn a 0.6 hole at the top and a 0.6 hole at the bottom with a 0.2 at the neck here. And the neck appears to be hmm, two millimetres below where we think the theoretical focal point for the lens should be. The next one along is interesting because I didn't have a two and a half inch zinc selenide plano convex. What I actually had was a two and a half inch zinc selenide meniscus lens. Now when we look at the meniscus lens, this looks even better. Look, it starts off at 0.6, very similar, up here at nine millimetres above the focal point, and it does things fairly similarly to the two inch lens, all the way down through the focus here, where we get, as we would expect, because it's a bigger lens, a bigger spot size, 0.3. And here at nine millimetres above the work, we're still getting a 0.5 hole in our material. We then move on to the 63.5 or two and a half inch gallium arsenide. Now, as I said before, these gallium arsenide meniscus lenses are a bit like hen's teeth. Very, very difficult to find, but okay, it's great because we can now compare what a meniscus lens 
between gallium arsenide and a meniscus lens in zinc selenide actually look like? And the answer is, well, at the top here, when we are above the focus point, in other words, when we're close to the nozzle, we start at 0.5 diameter hole as opposed to 0.6 for its zinc selenide brother. This one finished up with a 0.3, call it spot size, and it looks as though it's around about one millimeter um, above what we would expect the focus point to be. And then it finishes up at 0.6 as opposed to 0.5. So on balance, it looks as though the most powerful lens that we're going to find is going to be this one here. Now, whether or not we shall find that to be true when we start doing our cutting tests would be an interesting point. We have proved categorically that the power in the beam is not really diverging anywhere near as much as the the beam itself. There is a core of energy that stays pretty close to the center of the beam. And that's the core of energy that seems to be doing all the damage. Yes, I've currently got the two and a half inch gallium arsenide lens in here. So on that basis, if I bring the focus nine millimeters above center, I should be able to punch a hole, even though that's well out of focus, I should be able to punch a hole through a piece of 10 millimeter thick acrylic. 10 millimeters. So let's have a test, should we? Just to show you how live these sessions are, in the space of 10 seconds, I've changed my mind and what we're going to do, we're going to work from the other end of the focal range. I'm going to set this to plus nine millimeters. Now what that means is, relative to our piece of card, We've now set this distance here to the absolute extremity of the power that we were able to use to burn a hole in the card. Now remember, at this point, we've probably got something like nearly two millimeter diameter spread of scorch mark. Now this is acrylic, this is not card. And the damage threshold for this material will be substantially different than that of the card. So I'm going to use exactly the same card settings initially, i.e. 20% power and 20 millisecond pulse. And we'll see what damage we can do to acrylic. Well, there is the merest mark in there. And you can see it's about probably a millimeter diameter. Now there obviously is enough power in that beam to damage the material. So I'm not going to change the power away from 20% power. I'm going to leave the power as it is, and I'm going to increase the time. And that should allow it to burn further into the material. Okay, now this time we've got 500 milliseconds on there, half a second. No, we've not quite made it through. So I'll go up to the maximum the machine can go to is it can't quite make one second. It can do 999 milliseconds, which is close enough. Now, I've got a very small amount of air assist on here, just enough to protect the lens. Okay, and that's just about burnt through. Now, we've already carried out this test at nine millimeters below the focal point, plus another 10 millimeters. And the only thing that we've changed is the amount of time that we allowed for the beam to burn. But it does clearly show that we have still got power outside the extremity that I've already tested for on a material that is a lot more difficult to cut than paper. So we've still got power coming right down the center of that beam, even though it's diverging even more. So let's raise the job by nine millimeters and start off at the focal point. It's a little bit close there. I'll just move that along a little bit so that it's much clearer to see. And now we'll go to the other extreme, nine millimeters above the focal point. Let's have a look at these results. I need you to ignore this second track here. The three tracks we're gonna concentrate on are A, B, and C. Here with track A, and I'm going to put my 0.7 lead down into the hole, just as a guide, so that you can see that approximately halfway down, 
we've got a 0.7 diameter hole and at the mouth here we've probably got about 0.9 and down at the bottom here it looks as though we've got around about 0.5 because this hole here is 0.5 and this hole here well look in the center it's even less now for several months I've been trying to get answers to this very, very obvious question. Why is it that a diverging beam can produce a parallel hole in a piece of material? I've raised this question with several universities and learned professors associated with laser cutting. I have spent time asking the question at one or two of the big optical companies. And all I get is maybe it's this effect or maybe it's that effect. Maybes are not good enough. I want to know for a fact what causes it. Now, it may be something to do with quantum physics. I have got no idea, but it's way beyond my capability. But what we're doing here is a pragmatic assessment to see if we can get a sort of an answer. It doesn't tell us exactly what the mechanism is, but it does show us clearly that what we've got here is a beam of energy right through the axis of the lens which remains beautifully consistent and stable. I'm sure I was watching either a video or reading a piece of information issued by Universal, which indicated this parallel hole that's created in um, acrylic was all to do with light reflection, total internal reflection. And I believe that until now. Let's, let's look at this as an example. If when the light enters this hole, it bounces around internally and produces a lovely parallel hole all the way down. It enters at 0.5 and it exits at 0.5. Now if we accept that logic that there is a light pipe here which is reflecting the energy and causing it to just burrow through in a parallel manner, then why doesn't this one do the same thing? It's not parallel, in fact it's getting thinner and then thicker. And this one is even worse. It starts off big at 0.9 millimetres diameter. If it was an internal reflection, it would stay at 0.9 millimetres diameter. So the logic says, sorry, no internal reflection. This is purely due to the high energy density core that's in the beam. Well, that's somewhat of a surprising result, isn't it? Just this first session, and we've already discovered several major things about lenses and it's given us a little bit of foresight into what might happen when we start using these lenses for cutting now. It is very important that we understand how the energy is actually being used after the lens to affect cutting. Different materials damage at different levels of power but the question is why? And hopefully, as we start digging into uh, different materials, different focal length lenses, we shall hopefully find out which is the best lens to use for different materials. And maybe we'll be able to, with a little bit more research, discover why it is that different materials require different settings. I know it sounds a pretty obvious question. You can't cut acrylic at the same speed as you can cut wood. I've just jumped to some fairly staggering conclusions. You have seen exactly the same evidence that I have seen. You may draw a different conclusion. But hey, we're going to push on and we're going to hopefully use some of these deductions and conclusions that we've raised here with our cutting experiments in the next two sessions. So I hope I haven't blown your mind too much. And until the next two sessions, thanks for your time and I shall see you then.